is, uh, I think. Dear colleagues, dear friends, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to Seoul. It is 10.30 in South Korea. So it is my pleasure to announce today our speaker. Uh, this is MS Ryu from Swash University. So uh, we are in the fourth season of our seminar. So the seminar is focusing in the season of uh, colleagues yeah, in an early stage of their career. And today uh, we have a great speaker. Ernest uh, received his uh, master and uh, his uh, PhD from uh, Stanford University. Yeah, he spent there six years. His PhD supervisor was uh, Stephen Boyd. And uh, from 2016, 2019, he was uh, assistant adjunct professor at UCLA in the group of Votaoin. In the beginning of 2020, he moved to South Korea, to, to Seoul. Ernest is uh, working uh, on numerical methods for optimization, machine learning, uh, motor operator theory, so for sorry, sorry motor inclusions. Uh, yeah, he wrote a number of uh, great papers and is uh, one of the most uh, promising uh, young researchers of our community. So, Ernest, thank you for accepting our invitation. We have 45 minutes for the talk. Thank you, Rav Edu, for, uh, for the kind introduction and for giving me uh, this great opportunity to present my work. So my talk today is titled A Non-Nestrop Acceleration Methods for Making Gradients Small in Convex Minimization and Convex Concave Minimax Optimization. So today I'll talk about accelerated methods, but the ones that are not exactly of Nestrop's type. So before I spend a talk, a talk about the content of this talk, I'll just spend 30 seconds on sort of giving an update on, on what I've been up to. So last year, um, as uh, Radu has mentioned, uh, I, moved, I moved to uh, Seoul National University in Korea. Now prior, prior to this move, uh, my primary research area was um, a splitting methods and monotone operator theory. And by the way, Wotao and I have, we finally finished our, our uh, a graduate level textbook on monotone operator theory and splitting methods. So if you're interested um, on, on learning about this stuff, or if you're interested in teaching a course, uh, I would encourage you to check out the book. Uh, but since then, I've uh, since moving to Korea, I've started to work on more machine learning. Everybody, I guess, everybody ha has feels the pressure, and also I've started working on um, acceleration. And today, I'll share my recent work on acceleration, uh, 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 especially of non nestrop type. So um, let me uh, set. Up, let's first uh, set up the context. So consider the pr problem of minimizing um, the, a function f, where uh, the function f is assumed to be convex and smooth. The classical gradient descent method, um, under the assumption of smooth convexity, converges with converges with the rate one over k. However, this one over k rate is suboptimal, and Nesterov's uh, cel celebrated accelerated gradient method, which has this two line description converges with the accelerated rate, one over k squared. So this is, um, I, I imagine most of the audience uh, in, in the seminar is aware of this re result. So the question that I wish to pose is, can we perform a similar type of acceleration for other setups? Today I'll discuss, uh, let me quickly outline today's talk. So today I'll discuss three different setups and three different um, um, accelerated mecha acceler acceleration mechanisms for uh, each of them, respectively. The first setup that I'll talk about is the smooth convex concave minimax optimization setup. For smooth minimax and convex concave minimax optimization, we consider the minimax optimization problem where we minimize with respect to x and maximize with respect to y a convex concave saddle function L. And we assume that the saddle function L is R smooth. We can't say L smooth because the loss function is L. So we're going to say R smooth. And uh, recently, minimax optimization has gained uh, popularity due to its use in uh, adversarial training uh, in machine learning. We say um, a pair of primal dual uh, 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 variables, X star and Y star, solves the minimax optimization problem if it is a saddle point. In other words, uh, we say x star comma y star is a solution if it is a Nash equilibrium. Um, unilaterally, changing the, unilaterally changing the value of x increases the loss value of the L value, and unilaterally changing y decreases the loss value. For, not for notational convenience, we'll define the saddle operator g 
and G will just be the concatenation of the gradients with respect to X and the gradients with respect to Y. However, we will change the sign of the gradient with respect to Y so that this becomes a monotone operator. Uh, uh, so I, I, I won't define monotonicity uh, here, but uh, it, we have this sign, sign difference because we want to minimize with respect to X and we want to maximize with respect to Y. So the direction that we wanted to move in uh, is different between the two variables. So a point X comma Y star, or X comma Y, which we will uh, abbreviate as just Z. So Z is a saddle point of L if and only if the gradient mapping out outputs zero. Let's quickly review some classical results in minimax optimization. So one might consider just using um, gradient descent, but of course we can't just use gradient descent because uh, we want to maximize with respect to the Y variable. But we can perform some of uh, the analog of gradient descent, which is referred to as simultaneous gradient descent asset. So we take the gradients, gradients we descend with respect to the is, is x variable, and ascend with, with respect to the y variable. Using, using our more compact notation, we can just write the, the iteration in this way. Now, the problem of this iteration is that it doesn't converge in general. OK, so gradient, uh, uh, the analog of gradient descent doesn't converge. But the extra gradient algorithm, the classical extra gradient algorithm by Kropelovich, does converge. So here is a so this is a two line description of the EG algorithm, and this is a diagrammatical uh, uh, illustration. So starting at our iterate at z k, we take the uh, we compute the gradient mapping g, and then we move in the direction at minus alpha times uh, g to arrive at z k plus one half. So that's the definition of z k plus one half. Once we're at zk plus one half, we evaluate the gradient mapping g, but instead of moving in that gradient, negative gradient direction from zk plus one, we return to the original point zk, we return to the original point zk, and move in the direction of negative uh, g evaluated at zk plus one half, so this gradient, and, and that way we arrive at zk plus one. The extra gradient method um, under the smoothness condition in, in, in a smooth convex concave minimax optimization uh, is known to converge. And in fact, the extra gradient method is optimal. The duality gap uh, is the, is, which uh, can be defined in this way, is a notion that naturally generalizes the function value in convex optimization. So the average iterates of the extra gradient method converges at a rate one over k, and there exists a matching complexity lower bound that establishes the optimality up to constant of this of the extra gradient method, the average iterates of that. So the extra gradient method is um, already optimal when you measure your suboptimality using the duality gap, and because it is already suboptimal further acceleration is not possible. Or is it? So I said that the duality gap is, is, a, is a performance measure that naturally generalizes the function value in, in convex optimization. But what if we change the optimality measure? Because the duality gap as an optimal, optimality measure has uh, several drawbacks. One drawback, drawback is that it does not generalize really at all to the setup of non-convex, non-concave uh, uh, minimax optimization problems. Because the notion of the duality gap really only makes sense when you, um, in the presence of strong duality. And otherwise, even if you're at a, um, as a, at a local saddle point, you're not expected to have a zero duality gap in the non-convex concave setup. So the, the, the performance measure doesn't really make sense in the non-convex setup. Also, the duality gap is not a, not a quantity that can be measured throughout the algorithm. Evaluating the duality gap um, is, uh, is often as difficult as solving the just minimax optimization problem itself. So, um, in it, so the, the duality gap is not a quantity that, that you can use as a termination criterion, let's say. It's not something that you can um, uh, monitor throughout the progress of your algorithm, algorithm to see whether your algorithm is working well. Uh, it's, um, it's something that, I, that we can use in the theoretical, theoretical analysis, but practically speaking, uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to, to measure. So what if we change the optimality measure to the squared gradient norm? The squared gradient norm, norm is certainly measurable. It's, it's algorithmically observable. 
And it's also certainly um, the, it, it, it certainly does generalize to the um, non-convex, non-concave setup. Well, if, if we measure our performance with the squared gradient norm, then the extra gradient method and several other known methods, such as Popoff's method and, and the anchoring methods, exhibit, exhibit a rate of one over k on the best iterate. So since, the, since this one over k rate is the same, is, is, it, is essentially the same as the rate that we had with the duality gap, and, and since the duality gap uh, rate is optimal, one might think, expect this to be the optimal rate, but that's actually not the case. We can improve this rate. So the main result that I want to present in this first section is that um, we will first present what we refer to as the extra anchored gradient method, the EAG method, which achieves a one over k squared rate. And the second contribution is that um, this, this one over k squared uh, accelerator rate is, is actually uh, optimal up to a constant. And we establish that by presenting a matching lower bound. So here is the um, here is the general outline, the general form of the EAG algorithm, the extra anchor gradient. So I'll go through this algorithm slowly to, to give you time to stare at it. So start, so when we're positioned at position ZK, we take the grid, we evaluate the gradient mapping and we move in the negative gradient direction. But at the same time, we have this, what, what I call, what we refer to as the anchoring term. The anchoring term, Serves the, purpose, serves the purpose of pulling the iterate back towards the starting point Z0. This is Z0, that's the starting point of the algorithm. So we, we take the gradient step and then we move, we then pull the iterates back to the starting point a little bit. And the strength at which we pull the iterates back to Z0 is proportional to one over K plus two, one over K. So the, the strength of the anchor diminishes as the algorithm progresses. One step of that takes us to ZK plus one half. And then uh, at zk plus one half, we evaluate the gradient, and then we return to zk as we did with eg, and we, we do the same thing again. So at z at z to the powers at zk, um, we uh, take the uh, now the the extra gradient step, but at the same time we also have the anchor anchoring term uh, pulling us back to the starting point z zero. May, may I ask a question, Ernest? Of course. So, so this this looks uh, yeah very much similar to a Halpern iteration. Yes. Okay. Is this it's very much giving strong convergence? So I believe uh, it will. Okay. Um, I I haven't tried proving it for this setup, but I, I'm pretty sure it will. The okay. the classical Halpern uh, analysis doesn't directly apply because. Um, the this extra gradient step is not a it's it's quasi non-expensive but not non-expensive so we can't just cite the theorem and conclude strong convergence but I think if one tries uh, it, it should be possible to to it, it should not be too difficult to adapt the existing helper uh, proof to establish strong convergence. Okay, thank you. So the EAG method that I uh, laid up is a general template. Now I'll show you two instantiations of the EAG method. The first is EAG with constant step size, EAGC. So the step size, which, was, was, which used to be alpha k, now we just, we just fixed, that, fixed this to be value alpha. So um, the EAGC, when we choose alpha to be equal to one, one over eight r, uh, exhibits this accelerator rate. So it's 260 times r squared initial distance squared divided by k squared. So um, this is the, uh, an accelerator rate. The EAGC algorithm is, uh, well, um, you, you could argue whether this is a simple algorithm, but I would say it's a, it's a, it's a simpler algorithm compared to what I'll show uh, in the next slide. But the problem with this algorithm is, uh, first, the analysis is quite complicated. So we were able to find a proof of this, but um, it's, not, it's not a proof that I would recommend, uh, I would sort of comfortably recommend other people to read. Um, and also the constant here 260 is quite large. And that uh, I think is in part due to the fact that step size one over eight is quite restrictive. So the proof is complicated, the constant is large. So these are, I think, legitimate concerns. And the following algorithm to some extent um, addresses these issues. The second, the second instantiation of EAG, the EAG algorithm is EAG with varying step size, EAGV. 
So here we return to the uh, set where the step size alpha k uh, is iteration dependent, and we choose uh, alpha zero to be a certain value, and then the subsequent alphas are determined by this uh, by this recursion. The recursion looks a little bit scary, but in the end, it's just uh, computing some scalar values and uh, programming in this uh, recursion in a for loop is, of course, not at all difficult. So when we analyze this algorithm, uh, EAGV achieves uh, ex exhibits uh, this rate where it's one over k squared, but the constant is now about 10 times better. The constant is 27. The EAGV algorithm is uh, slightly more complicated than EAGC due to this recursion. But the analysis is far simpler. It's, this is a proof that I, I can comfortably recommend other people to read if, if anybody is interested. And the constant is, is again, uh, significantly better. Uh, I think uh, Manuel yeah. uh, yes. a question. has a question. Yes. yes. Yeah. Manuel, yes. Just, just a form of intuition. Uh, this looks indeed impressing. Uh, uh, is this step size somehow, uh, does it exhibit a choice of step size sequence, uh, nice features like monotonicity? Yes, or? yes. So I, I, I left that up, but in, in, the, in the paper, we have a lemma. So the lemma states that the, self, the step size alpha, whatever, however you choose it, so long as it satisfies this condition, it's a monotonically decreasing sequence and it converges to a non-zero limit. To a positive limit, so it converges to a positive limit. Yes, and this, if if you replace this positive limit for the EAGC, what happens then? Well, if you if we replace, uh, so if, let's call the limit alpha infinity. If we replace the sequence with uh, alpha infinity, then basically this convergence proof uh, it, it becomes activated. Yes. So, um, the, the reason then is the same, or for the, the constant, uh, I I haven't tried that exact what what you're what you're exactly describing um but um i'm not quite sure yes i'm sorry I'm for interrupting sure. just just to for, to get a feeling mm -hmm. about this iteration for the step mm -hmm. set thank you so, um, so, so, so have have a, another question sorry uh, sorry yes Ernest, uh, you have a second question yes uh, sorry, so, uh, yes I'll, I'll add one more thing before i take okay. uh, constantine's question okay so, yes um the reason we have this iteration is because uh, this uh, this um uh, recursion is because there's a term that basically has this term that has this coefficient and by setting this by using this like that term just vanishes so the proof becomes significantly simpler um yeah constantine uh, sure. uh i'm happy to take your question yeah uh this algorithm really reminds me of how iteration somehow combined with extra <laughs> gradient Yes. Do you certainly. see a connection here? Yes. So okay. So um, we uh, described that connection in the paper. So um, basically, this algorithm, uh, the in terms of its components, it it really is extra gradient plus uh, helper. So anchoring. Uh, so the name is uh, extra anchored gradient, right? So it has the name eg in it. The term anchor is is a re is to be honest a rebranding by 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 me, um, but. Mm -hmm. Um, for the minimax optimization setup, um, the EG, as I had described, achieves a one over K rate. And there is another uh, prior work that I, that uh, prior paper that I written um, that basically that says, roughly speaking, if we use the, the um, helper type, the term, uh, we can also get a one over K, something close to a one over K rate for minimax optimization. So there are two distinct, so what my, my reasoning was, that there are two distinct mechanisms, mechanisms for this problem that achieves a one over K rate. What if we combine them? And I, that was kind of a, I was half joking when I said that to my student, but when we investigated it uh, and investigated it, uh, it turns out combining the two one over K mechanisms gives you a one over K squared mechanism. Okay, thank you. So Ernest, may, may I ask if the, I mean, the result you mentioned about Harper, it is a, it is a result of uh, Felix Lida. Um, else. Yes. Well, okay. So okay. the the um, the uh, help. Well, okay. So help an iteration has. A, I'm, not, I'm not fully aware of the actually help an iteration literature, but it has. A, I'm aware it has a long hi history. But recently, a Felix Leader and also Donghwan Kim, the the two people wrote uh, two papers, uh, made two independent equivalent discoveries of an accelerated. Okay. Uh, Halpern uh, method, okay. and I, I'm, and that, that's actually the second section of my of today's talk. So okay. I'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So, all right. So let me very quickly outline the the proof of these uh, of the EAG analyses. So the um, 
the, the main analysis uh, is a Lyapunov analysis, uh, or uh, I, re I refer to this as a Lyapunov analysis. Um, so we define the sequence of VK, um, and, and what, I, what, I, uh, what I mean by I, I, I refer to this as Lyapunov is that I'm, ne I'm not making any assertion that this VK is a positive quantity. The, the VK, in fact, will usually become negative. But in any case, we define the sequence VK, and we show that it is not increasing. Now, that's the, this is the hard part. So showing that this VK sequence is non-increasing um, takes a lot of work. For EGC, it's extremely complicated. For EAGV, it's, it's manageable, but that's the main uh, meat of the proof. Once this uh, non-decreasing property, non-increasing property has been established, the remaining convergence proof is rather simple. So um, I'll, I'll, I won't explain this in the interest of time, but what, what's on this slide, what's on this like slide is this is the full argument. So it's not that complicated. If you were to spend the time, um, 15 minutes, you'd be able to understand it uh, uh, entirely. Okay, so EAG um, achieves a one over k squared rate on squared graded magnitude for minimax optimization. Um, now, is this optimal? Where, well, the, the rate is, of, is optimal, and we establish that by presenting a, uh, a, a matching complexity lower bound. So the, um, because this is a minimax optimization problem, uh, there are two sets of variables, the x variable and the y variable. And, and because of that, everything becomes at least twice co as complicated. So the, uh, just in terms of the notation. So um, here, this is the regular uh, span condition that we are most, that um, uh, many of us are quite familiar with uh, from the, from let's say Nestrov's textbook. This is the, but um, because this is a minimax optimization problem, we need to specify two span conditions, uh, for one for X and one for Y. Now this span condition uh, 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 is, is set up so that it, this algorithm class uh, accommodates both let's say the regular simultaneous and alternating gradient descent ascent methods, and essentially all the first order gradient methods that you would uh, consider um, uh, uh, in, in an algorithm for these uh, algorithm classes. So the way we establish this uh, one over k squared matching complexity lower bound is by reducing to a linear system solve. So the worst case construction is done in this way. And if you take the gradient and, uh, and think about what that means, uh, finding a saddle point of this lot, minimax loss function, so setting the gradient and, and, and finding a zero of the gradient of that gradient, is equivalent to solving the linear system A x equals B, where A is a symmetric matrix. And because of this, and because uh, of this particular structure, the span condition becomes a significantly uh, simpler and much more familiar. So the span condition becomes x k and y k uh, resides within the k minus one Krylov subspace with respect to the matrix A and the, the, the vector B. So, and uh, Nemirovsky's uh, classical work result has uh, already established lower bounds for, for the iteration complexity of solving AX is equal to B. So basically this is the exact complexity lower bound that I had in the previous uh, theorem. So I'm skipping the details, but by reducing the minimax setup to Nemirovsky's classical setup of solving uh, of the complexity of solving AX is equal to B, and Nemirovsky utilizes uh, linear algebraic techniques, Krylov subspaces, matrix polynomials to prove this. Um, so based on that reduction, we can establish the one over k squared matching complexity lower bound. So here are some brief experiments. Um, so um, basically, this is uh, so. So these are the uh, one over k squared algorithms, and this is the guideline is uh, indicating the one over k squared rate. And we see that uh, the EAG methods indeed outperform <clears throat> the EG method and the Popov method, the other existing uh, methods. On the right is an illustration of, of, of the different algorithms applied to um, um, the right uh, on a 2D sample problem. So the, this 2D example illustrates the worst case behavior of, X, of the extra gradient method. The worst case behavior is the iterates cycling around the solution and EG does converge. So it will eventually converge to the solution at the origin, but we have this very slow slight cycling behavior. In contrast, the EAG algorithm converges much more directly to the solution because, and this is my intuition, that's because the, um, the anchor term um, provides some sort of dampening effect. So this cycling behavior is the worst scenario, worst case, and that worst case is dampened by the anchoring term. Uh, at least that's, that's my intuition, and that's what, what is happening in this particular example. And next, Mark has a question. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Tabu. Yes, Ernest, uh, first of all, thanks for this uh, 
very nice uh, piece of uh, analysis of work. I'm just curious Thank about you. the uh, condition on the, uh, on, it looks like the, you have this same res restrictive condition for, for establishing the lower bone. You're asking that, uh, or I'm maybe mistaken, it's like in the uh, gradient methods that you're asking that the dimension is uh, greater or equal than k over two, right? That's Yes. That's uh, that's exactly the same condition, right? Like in when you do uh, acceleration in in Alanestero, Al right? Or I'm wrong. I don't. I just I just don't remember. Right. So 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 this is the dimension. So the dimension has to be sufficient. Has to be basically larger than the number of iterations. Yeah. And a similar condition is is um, let's say imposed on the, on the Nestorov's construction of the. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, so that's exactly the same, right? And so, uh, so okay. the so the argument that you you base your argument on Nemirovsky's proof. So he's also using essentially the same type of argument in his own proof on the linear system. I just don't remember. I, I read that paper a long time ago. I don't, I don't remember the details. <laughs> so right, right. Uh, well, so so in Nemirovsky's uh, construction, he's he basically uses these um, these matrix polynomials, and he and uh, in his proof, he needs sufficiently uh, the dimension to be sufficiently large so that he can place eigenvalues in these appropriate positions. Okay. Okay, 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 fine. So that makes sense. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, to quickly uh, summarize. So, um, so by providing the EAG method and a matching complexity larva, we established the one over k squared optimal uh, rate on this particular problem class. And this work was presented, uh, was published in uh, 2021, this year's uh, ICML. Okay. So I'll move on to the, um, so today, uh, these are three, um, they are related, but they are in distinct uh, acceleration uh, mechanisms, and, but they all have in common that they are not Nestorov acceleration. The second acceleration mechanism is uh, for monotone inclusions and uh, fixed point iterations. So, so the monotone inclusion problem uh, uh, is posed as finding a, a zero of a maximal monotone operator A. The proximal point method, the classical proximal point method, um, exhibits a one over k one over k rate on the uh, fixed point uh, residual. Now, recently, uh, as Radu was uh, uh, asking, the accelerated proximal point method was uh, presented by Donghwan Kim, and this was published in in Math Programming. This method achieves a one over k squared rate and. I, I thought I, I was quite surprised. I, I found this result to be quite shocking. I always assumed that the KM iteration, the, the proximal point method would be optimal, but it's not. So one over K squared is, the, it, um, uh, it is achievable by the accelerated proximal point method. Now let's uh, also at the same time consider um, the related and, and essentially equivalent fixed point problem. So we consider the problem of finding a fixed point of a non-expansive operator T. The, uh, the operator T, uh, well, we can find a fixed point using the Krasnoselsky man iteration, the KM iteration. And here I'm just using the, uh, the, the, the average in coefficient one over two. And this provides us with a one over K rate on the fixed point residual. Um, but recently, uh, Felix Leder uh, published in, op in the optimization letters, a, um, a helper type method that achieves a one over K squared rate. And here it's important that the Halpern, the coefficients. So here in, the, in, a, in a Halpern method, uh, we average in, instead of the previous iterate, we average in the starting point x zero. And in order to achieve this k squared rate, it's important that uh, these, uh, the, these coefficients be chosen in this specific way. The weight on the initial point x zero needs to be of order one over k. So this also, I think is a quite surprising result. These two methods are actually, um, they look different and they are phrased differently, but these, are, these independent discoveries are equivalent. So the way they, the, these two people discover these methods, Kim and Leader, they discover these methods using the computer-assisted proof methodology referred to as the performance estimation problem. It's, this is due to uh, Drury and Taboul initially and uh, Taylor, Hendricks, and Glenor uh, refined it further. The, um, the discoveries are remarkable and it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it, it's, it's remarkable and quite surprising. And both, proof, both papers came, written by Kim and Leader, they provide proofs of these, uh, uh, they provide uh, convergence proofs and the rates uh, of, uh, within their papers. 
But the issue is that at least in my, uh, at least to me, the proofs that they provide are difficult to understand because basically what they do is they discover the proof and the, 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 when you find a proof with the performance estimation problem, um, if, if I simplify and exaggerate just uh, quite significantly, um, the, the, the algorithm basically gives you a convergence proof. But the convergence proof is not really, it's verifiable by, by humans, but it's not really intelligible by humans. So um, you can go through the proofs line by line and verify the calculations, but, and it's, these are not that long. So if you spend a day, you can verify the proof, but it's at the end, you, you, you still feel confused. At least I felt confused even after reading and verifying and, and convincing myself that these proofs were correct. Let me first state the two rates, uh, the rates of, uh, uh, that, that the Kim and uh, leader presented. So the, 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 the accelerated proximal point method achieves uh, this particular rate. The uh, OHM method, well, it's the same thing, but we can also equivalently, equivalently express the rate in this way. Um, so initially the proofs were presented uh, again, using the performance estimation problem uh, machinery, and they were difficult to understand. But now we have a at least, uh, we have a better proof that's more intelligible by humans. So the key idea is to define this uh, Lyapunov function. This is uh, this Lyapunov function has three terms, and all three terms are non-negative. So this is a Lyapunov function in a more traditional sense. Um, and then we show that the Lyapunov function uh, is non-increasing, and then that's basically it. That's the end of the proof. So showing this step is uh, takes a little bit of work, but once we establish the non-increasing property, the proof is essentially done. Okay, so um, so Kim and Leader presented these accelerated uh, methods for fixed point iterations for for monotone inclusions. Um, the optimality they were um, presumed optimal. Uh, I, I I talked to. to uh, uh, based on personal communication, but they, there wasn't a proof of optimality. So in our recent work, uh, we present uh, a, a matching complexity lower bound, actually a, an exact matching complexity lower bound. So these two methods are exactly optimal. And remember, this is exactly the accelerated uh, rate of these two. These were at, this was exactly the, the, the rate that we had seen in the previous slide, uh, including up to the constant. So we have an exact matching complexity lower bound in the sense that it's not optimal just to, up to the constant, it's optimal it, up to everything. Okay, so here this, I'm stating this result informally. I'm not describing what the exact span condition is because um, uh, first of all, in the interest of time and also because this is uh, unf unfinished work, but uh, we have this result. And I want to just, just quickly outline uh, some of the results that we have in this work that we are currently in the process of writing. So the accelerated proximal point uh, establishes that the, PP, the classical proximal point is suboptimal and can be uh, accelerated. It's actually, uh, I, uh, it's actually possible to accelerate the regular fixed point iteration uh, in, 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 when you have strong mon monotonicity or when the operator is contracted. So when an operator T is contractive and when it is a gamma ellipsis with gamma strictly less than one, this classical iteration by Picard and Banach, uh, they uh, converge at the rate of gamma to the power of K. Um, so to informally state the result that we have um, with a mechanism with the Halpern uh, type of mechanism analogous, uh, similar to what we, what we had seen in the accelerated proximal point, we can actually accelerate the classical fixed point iteration in the contractive and strongly monotone setup. And we also have a matching complexity lower bound uh, showing that the rate is exactly optimal. And uh, we can also extend this acceleration. So we have an acceleration for the, uh, monotone, uh, the, the, the monotone case, the strongly monotone case, which is equivalent to the non-expansive and the contractive case. We can also uh, extend the acceleration mechanism to something in between. So if we assume our operator is quasi uniformly, uniformly monotone, uh, so, um, and the precise definition is that the operator uh, satisfies this condition with respect to a uh, fixed point uh, with a zero uh, X star, then the classical proximal point method achieves uh, this rate. And uh, if we use a certain restarting scheme based on the accelerated proximal point method, we can accelerate the rate uh, to, to this uh, better rate. And uh, we can uh, we uh, uh, 
try this, try this acceleration scheme uh, with some experiments. So on the left, we have a, uh, the total variation, the CT reconstruction uh, uh, you know, algorithm using the primal dual hybrid, hybrid gradient method or the Schumbold Pock method. And when we use this uh, acceleration scheme, uh, the, this, the, the yellow line is the accelerated method and we do see a practical improvement. On the right, we, are, we have an experiment with, uh, uh, it's a, the problem is a decentralized uh, compressed sensing problem where we use the PG extra decentralized algorithm. And the PG extra algorithm uh, is, uh, can be accelerated using the, uh, uh, the, the Halpern type acceleration mechanism uh, and, uh, to get a uh, uh, visible improvement. So um, this was a more uh, uh, rough and, and quick description of our work, but to summarize our claims, our claims is that the classical fixed point iterations are suboptimal and we present, uh, we will be presenting acceler acceleration schemes for fixed point iterations and provide matching complexity lower bounds. And uh, this, uh, is, uh, this is upcoming result. This is an upcoming uh, paper that we are in the process of writing. Uh, and that's, uh, I, I apologize for the sparse details, but that's why I'm, I'm only uh, describing the results at a high level. Okay, um, then let me, uh, move on to the third topic that I wanted to present today. And that's uh, for acceleration for making gradient small in smooth convex minimization. So the problem setup is smooth convex minimization, but instead of trying to reduce the function value, which is that was done by Nesterov, uh, the problem of interest here is to make gradients small. But before we talk about that, the specific uh, problem, uh, let, uh, he, let, let me uh, describe the um, overarching goal that we had in mind when we first started working on this problem. So the, the, the goal that we had in mind was to find some sort of um, geometric structure of acceleration. So as we all know, there are many accelerated methods that have been developed, developed since Nesterov's uh, 1983 seminal work, but these methods have been de developed and analyzed with a, a very dis disparate te te techniques without a unified framework. So the question that we pose is, is there some sort of um, geometric structure that is common among all these many accelerated methods. And those of you who are aware of my uh, work on the scaled relative graph SRG, I've, I have personally, I'm just personally interested in geometric approaches. So this is where, um, if you have seen my prior work on SRG, you, you would see where I'm coming from. In any case, um, um, in this work, we'll be presenting, uh, we'll, be, we'll be describing the parallel structure of acceleration that's common among many accelerated methods. And, uh, and the use of this uh, insight is that based on this, we will be able to better understand the acceleration mechanism of OGMG, and uh, we'll be able to extend the acceleration to the proximal gradient, the uh, FISTA setup. So let me first describe what the OGMG method is. So the OGMG method was uh, presented by Kim, uh, Donghwan Kim and Jeffrey Fessler. And the, acceler the method has this form. So it, is in some is it, it is in some ways similar to Nesterov acceleration, but it has some uh, some very key differences. So here I'm using the notation that plus means at the current point at a current point we take a gradient step. So x k plus that means at position x k we take a gradient step with respect to with a uh, step size one over l. This first term kind of looks like what you would uh, see in uh, this term basically looks exactly what you would see. Uh, in Nesterov's fast gradient, uh, fast gradient method, but we have this additional term. Um, and, but the most uh, unusual aspect of OGMG is that the theta coefficients um, satisfy this reverse, uh, uh, re reverse recursion. So this might seem like exactly the same recursion that you would see with Nesterov's uh, the theta parameters, but, and it is indeed the same, essentially the same formula, but the subset, the, the, the indices are flipped. And we have a reverse, uh, reverse iteration rather than a forward iteration, uh, recursion defining these, uh, these, theta, uh, these theta parameters. So OGMG uh, is similar to, uh, in, in its form to Nesterov's accelerated gradient method, but it has some key crucial differences. And in any case, when you evaluate these scalar values, they come out to be completely different compared to, to Nesterov's method. OGMG, uh, when you apply to convex minimization, achieves this one over k squared rate on the squared gradient magnitude of, of the con smooth convex function. 
This result also was discovered using a computer assisted methodology. And again, the original proof by Kim and Fessler, in my view, it, at least to me, was quite difficult to, to understand. I was able to follow it and, and verify its correctness, but I wasn't, uh, I, I was left confused. So the OGMG method achieves a one over k squared rate on the squared gradient magnitude. Now, interestingly, you can simply com combine OGMG with the well-known uh, fast gradient method to achieve a one over k to the power four rate on reducing the squared gradient magnitude. So I, I call this method, I refer to this method as, method as FGM plus OGMG, and let me describe the method. So you, you start at position x zero, and then you run k iterations of the regular fast gradient method. And then there is a, and then you, the met method terminates at a, at a certain point. And then you continue with OGMG from that uh, termination point, And then you run K iterations from there of OGMG. So in total, you execute two K iterations. And then this concatenated method exhibits the a one over K to the power four rate rather than one over K squared. Now here's, a re here's the reason. The classical fast gradient method um, achieves a one over k squared rate uh, where we have an initial condition of the square distance to solution and the square, the k, k squared rate is on the function value. The OGMG method takes as an initial condition a function value suboptimality and then returns a, a k squared rate on the squared gradient magnitude. So by concatenating these two methods, because the terminal guarantee and the initial condition of FGM and OGMG match, we are able to achieve a initial uh, condition to terminal guarantee with a rate of one over k squared, where these two rates have been multiplied. This technique, this trick, by the way, was pointed out by uh, Nestrov et al. So I should speed up a little, a little bit, but okay. So Nestrov's fast gradient method, um, this classical method, has this form, and uh, and it is well known that we can equivalently. Uh, express Nestorov's FGM using this uh, ZK auxiliary iterate. And this ZK iterate is useful because, well, we can first of all express the algorithm in this equivalent way, but also because it is utilized in the convergence analysis of Nestorov's FGM. So Nestorov's fast gradient method achieves a one over K squared rate. And it can be um, one way to establish this rate, one way to prove this is, is by a Lyapunov analysis. So we define this energy function UK, which, which has this form. And in particular, the Lyapunov function definition involves the auxiliary ZK iterates. And once we, can, once we show that the UK uh, uh, sequence uh, is not increasing, that's the hard part. Well, but once we establish this non-increasing property, basically the proof is done. Now in this work, we make uh, this observation and this ob observation by itself is not new, but uh, in the fast gradient method, um, this direction and this direction are parallel if you draw these iterates on what we refer to as the plane of iteration. So this, uh, so this structure has been pointed out uh, in uh, it, with the names uh, a method of similar triangles, but, uh, these, uh, but uh, here I, I point out that these two lines are, are parallel. But Nestorov's fast gradient method is widely known and it's, well, it's, it's the seminal uh, algorithm, but it's actually not, it's not the optimal, it's not the exactly optimal method in the smooth convex minimization setup. Recently uh, in the year 2014, 2016, um, the optimized gradient method has, was proposed. The optimized gradient method has this form and it also can be equivalently written uh, in this way. The, if you write it in this way, by defining this auxiliary sequence, the difference between the optimized gradient method and the fast gradient method lies here. So here in the OGM method, there is a factor two, that's the, that the coefficient here. This is the only difference between OGM and FGM. If we remove this coefficient two, we recover the uh, classical fast gradient method. The analysis of OGM can also be done with a Lyapunov analysis. So we define this Lyapunov function um, that also involves this ZK auxiliary iterate. We establish the non-increasing property and that's basically, the, and, and then you, you perform one or two steps of arguments and then you're done. OGM has a better rate than compared to Nestorov's FGM. 
So here there is no factor two in the convergence rate. If you go back to the slide, if I were to go back to the slide uh, describing the FGM's rate, there would be a factor two. So OGMG, OGM is faster, has a rate, uh, has a guarantee that is smaller, better than FGM by a factor of two. Now, interestingly, uh, OGM also has this parallel structure. So these, this line and this line, if we do, uh, do, uh, draw the iterates on this plane of iteration, has uh, satisfies this parallel property. So we'll, do, we'll call this structure the, the, a, a, a parallel structure for, acceler for these uh, first order accelerated methods. And for the strongly convex setup, I won't describe it, but we can define an, an analogous collinear structure. So there will be several points that lie on the same line, and hence they are collinear. And there, many of the accelerated methods known in the literature satisfy these structures. So here's the, here's the long list, uh, fast gradient method. Uh, um, um, well, OK, so I won't, I won't go through the entire list, but it's a pretty long list that satisfies this pattern. Okay, so we identified the structure and we want to utilize it to uh, analyze, um, uh, to find new analyses. So we use, it, use this parallel structure, we utilize this parallel structure to analyze the OGMG method, which prior to this work didn't have, in my view, a uh, intelligible and, and, uh, and easily understandable uh, proof. So for OGMG, we define an auxiliary sequence ZK so that a parallel structure is satisfied. So we define ZK uh, in this way. And when we do so, we can express OGMG, the algorithm in this equivalent way. And now uh, these two lines are parallel and this is the algorithm description on the plane of iteration. And using this newly defined auxiliary iterate, we are able to perform a Lyapunov analysis of OGMG. So this is a, um, this is, uh, this Lyapunov function, uh, when I, at least when I first saw it, it felt quite foreign to me, but um, it, well, it, it is what it is, and uh, it does, and the definition of this Lyapunov function crucially relies on, the, on identifying the auxiliary sequence ZK that is used in this construction. So the, a Lyapunov analysis of OGMG involves uh, defining these, uh, this uh, Lyapunov function, the sequence, and establishing a non-increasing property. I'll skip over the next uh, two slides. Um, so this is a further discussion, discuss, description of how we utilize uh, this, the, this geometric insight in, in, uh, in, in our proofs. But then I'll move on to uh, the, the new result that we discover using this technique. So um, the idea is we want to, now that we have an understanding of how, a, how the proof of OGMG works, we want to at, extend this to the proximal gradient setup. So the proximal gradient setup is where we minimize a smooth convex function with a, pro with a proximal function added in. And we use a, I'm going to use this proximal gradient step notation. So we present this new method that we refer to as a uh, FISTA G. So it's, well, it's like the fast, it's, it's like the FISTA gradient method, but the coefficients are different. And the FISTA method, while the FISTA method aims to minimize the reduce the function value at rate one over k squared. Here we aim to minimize the, the squared gradient norm at rate one over k squared. So the coefficients satisfy this, uh, um, this uh, recursion. And the FISTA G method, uh, the analysis crucially relies on identifying this parallel structure. We define the auxiliary sequence to satisfy uh, you know, this, this parallel property. And we can establish a one over k squared rate on the function uh, uh, on the squared gradient norm given a function value sub function value suboptimality initial condition, and it relies on this Lyapunov function that uh, that is defined with this auxiliary sequence C k. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so we achieve a one over k squared rate um, with an initial with an initial condition of function value suboptimality. And by using the same trick uh, as Nestrov did, we can construct the FISTA plus FISTA G method. So we concatenate the two methods, FISTA and FISTA G, to achieve a one over k to the power four rate for reducing the squared gradient magnitude in the, uh, in, in the proximal gradient setup. 
And we have some compressed sensing experiments and indeed the FISTA plus FISTA, FISTA G uh, is really is indeed uh, more capable of reducing the function value, uh, re reducing the square gradient norm effectively. Okay, so uh, to summarize, we had identify a geometric structure that's common among a wide range of accelerated first order methods. And using this geometric insight, we better understand the acceleration mechanism of OGMG. And, and as the next step, we are able to extend this acceleration mechanism to the proximal gradient setup. And this is work based on uh, our paper uh, just a few days, uh, accepted to the NeurIPS conference just a few days ago. So I'm quite over time, but let me quickly summarize. So the space of deterministic first order convex optimization has actually quite a lot of uh, recent uh, exciting developments. So it's a very classical field, uh, uh, but um, new things are going on. And um, I attribute this new activity to the, uh, to the advent of the performance estimation problem technique. So uh, using this technique, new acceleration mechanisms have been discovered. And, uh, so, and th that's the contribution of, of other people. But my contribution here is to taking these newly discovered acceleration mechanisms, refining them, and generalizing, to, generalizing it to other set, uh, setups. An open problem that I wish to pose is, now that we have um, several, uh, at least apparently distinct acceleration mechanisms for different uh, problem setups, um, I'm quite curious as to whether these are, uh, there is any underlying relationship to them with them because um, they do look different, the coefficients are different, they have different structures, but um, is there really no difference? Uh, 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 is there really no relationship among them? Maybe there is a hidden non-apparent relationship, and if so, I would really like to know. Okay, uh, thank, uh, okay so um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ernest, for a great talk. So, and uh, yeah, a very nice statement. Very nice results, in particular, yeah, the very nice recent results. So it was a great pleasure. So, thank you. Uh, are there questions? Yeah, I have. Uh, Mark, Mark. Just a curiosity. Uh, what? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Eli. It was uh, an exciting talk. Uh, thank uh, you. Um, and very clearly, very clearly presented. Also, that's uh, very important. Uh, what would be what would be the uh, the uh, the rate? I mean, your uh, FISTA G. What would be was that? Would it be possible to 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 get some information on function values with these iterations? Um. <laughs> so, um, okay. So I I I perhaps should have tried this. I, okay. So I should have, I probably should have prepared for that uh, that question. So, <laughs> Just to so, kill. Because so, so the way, so, so the way we could prepare, we, I could just like get the answer to your question is to um, use the performance estimation problem uh, methodology. For example, so, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so Adrian, uh, Adrian Taylor has written this Pesto toolbox. So I could just plug this in and you know, wait like twenty four hours yeah. and then get uh, the convergence rate. But here's my here's my guess. Um, I, I think the rate is um, not even going to be one over k. I, I, I suspect the rate is oh, going really? may, may even be um, of order one. On the function value, because um, I, I think so. I I, I think I, I if I I probably I should I probably shouldn't say things uh, in a, in this public venue uh, things that I haven't fully verified. But um, the OGMG and FISTA G they're very much tuned to reduce the function squared function the squared gradient norm. So um, you wouldn't expect them to be good at reducing function values. But I think OGMG is optimized so extremely to the point that it really you really have a, a, a no guarantee at all on the function value reduction. And I think oh, FISTA G will have uh, a similar property. I see. OK, well, that uh, could be interesting. So anyway, so you, what you are saying is essentially there is a, a, a big discrepancy in the uh, the way that uh, we see when you do the analysis through the uh, gradient norm square and the function values, that's a completely uh, divergent uh, or maybe orthogonal uh, a way of, uh, of thinking of, uh, of measuring progress of algorithms in some sense. Right, they're completely different. I wouldn't say they're orthogonal because um, if you, um, any guarantee on the function value translates to the, at least, yeah. At least in this smooth setup, like a guarantee on the function yeah. value translates to a great guarantee on the square gradient norm, yeah, um, right. but not the other way around. Yeah, so yeah. the Nesterov's, Nesterov's FGM has a one over k squared rate 
uh, on the squared gradient norm, which, and if you spend a few minutes, it's, it, it's, a it's a natural corollary. It doesn't have a K to the power four rate. So uh, in, th in that sense, so yes, yeah, so they are completely, I think, divergent, but I don't think they're, uh, but they, they must be related some, in some ways. Yeah, no, that's interesting because usually we used to use the, the norm of the guardian for non-convex problem, not for convex problem, right? That's Correct, right. That's of course a very standard uh, uh, way. And another question, how about the uh, extension of your uh, first part of the talk to, to constraint uh, problem? Is that uh, trivial? Okay. Or it's, so, uh, or it's, uh, or it's, uh, it's not. Um, no, so no, nothing I, is trivial, Mark. Uh, well, no, I mean, I'm asking, I'm asking Ernest because in, 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 in the game here, so maybe you already tried or maybe it has. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm happy to share my, uh, my, my negative the, my negative results. So, so first of all, I, I should I forgot to mention, but uh, this algorithm, this exact algorithm, without any modification, works for um, uh, Lipschitz continuous monotone uh, operators as well. Mm -hmm. But okay. um, so, but uh, Professor Temple, so your question was about constraints. So we didn't try constrained uh, 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 this the constraint setup, but we did try the proximal gradient setup, and okay. our. Um, and uh, well, okay, so <laughs> it, it didn't it didn't work. So uh, um, and to I think we can attribute the the cost to this. So the extra gradient method um, has a one over k rate on the squared uh, gradient norm, and this is actually uh, people. Uh, so this result isn't published anywhere, but it's actually possible to establish a one over k rate on the last iterate with the extra gradient method. Okay. This last iterate guarantee does not work with the with pulsing's uh, forward backward forward method at least not that i'm aware of mm -hmm. so it's so it seems that perhaps the extra gradient method is better behaved compared to pulsing's uh, forward backward forward method and it seems to be that 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 sort of difference in uh, the the regularity of the methods translates to us be, uh, to translates to a difficulty in establishing whatever k squared rate in the proximal gradient uh, setup for for convex concave minimax Okay. So there is no, no no trivial way of uh, uh, getting that uh, that confidence for the, the constraint case. That's what you were saying, right? There's no well. At least when we try, at least it wasn't trivial for us to do this for the prox grad setup. But the constraint, of course, can be similar th than prox grad. So maybe yeah. for constraint case, it might be much more easier. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you, Constantine. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so you haven't discussed anything related to stochasticity here. I'm wondering right. if there is a way to kind of improve upon the results of Alan Zhu, because Alan Zhu uses double loop algorithms as far as I remember. And those are a little bit nicer than just single loop, the ones mm -hmm. that you do. Right, right. So, um, so, so the, 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 the first answer, well, okay. So the answer is I don't know. So. Um, we extending sort of these acceleration um, mechanisms to the stochastic setup is is indeed something that we're, we're uh, looking into. Um, so I, I feel though that the stochastic the first of all, I think the bottleneck in the stochastic setup seems to be in the stochasticity rather than um, rather than um, the uh, whatever it is that we're, we're we're accelerating in the deterministic setup. So um, so in that sense. I'm not quite sure to what to what extent these acceleration mechanisms will be applicable to, to the stochastic setup. I'm I'm not quite sure, and also at least for the uh, stochastic convex minimization setup, there seems to be a lot of um, dimension dependent bounds, and where where the dependency is rather mild. And but in the in the deterministic setup, it seems to be that. Um, if you want to get a dimension dependent result, uh, by if you want your convergence rate to involve the dimension d and then have some benefit, it, it seems to me that it, it seems that the 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 gain is not that significant compared to the stochastic setup. So um, I'm kind of rambling here, but I, I think there are, um, um, I I don't know. They, they they seem to be very different problems, and I'm I'm aware uh, of the the reason why it seems to me to be actually very similar is that Allen Ju's technique, they use regularization, something like we penalize the objective with um, second norm squared, Z zero minus ZK, which mm -hmm. is 
and by taking the gradient of that, we would just do something very similar to anchoring. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why it really resembles me what you're doing. And mm -hmm. uh, by doing that, you can improve and, uh, upon SGD because SGD mm -hmm. is suboptimal, at least without strong convexity. Right. So, um, so Alan Ju's um, recursive regularization technique um, does is is indeed quite feels quite similar to the anchoring technique, um, but here's what how I okay so I, I feel that they're different in, in, in this regard. So I think Al, so Alan Ju's uh, anchor like Alan Ju's recursive regularization the anchor point moves as the algorithm progresses here it, it doesn't move. But for for us we can also make it move and we can probably establish a similar guarantee. But the difference I think is think is Alan Ju is. I think he's he's using the the anchor to the regularization to uh, mitigate the, the the noise to control the noise. Whereas here we're, we're in the minimax optimization setup, we're we're trying to dampen the, the cycling behavior. So um, it, still, there there could be sort of con relationships connections. But if we use the anchoring term in the convex minimization setup, it doesn't seem like there's any benefit we can argue uh, for in the in the non rent in the deterministic setup. So it's, um, I would like, to, yes. So it's something we were looking into. I, I don't have any answers that I can give yet. Thank you. Are there other questions? So uh, there's a question in the chat. So, so Patrick yes. Johnston, Patrick is asking, what is the last iterate rate for its Paul Sang's FBF? Is it one over K? So the, a, um, so Paul Sang's FBF uh, method, uh, at least in his, I, uh, at least in the original paper, doesn't have a rate in the monotone setup. It just has convergence. But if you want to establish a rate, you can establish a one over k rate on the uh, on the best iterate. Um, I, I am not aware, and I was unable to establish a last iterate rate for Paul Singh's FBF method. No, but when, so when talk about about the rate, then then probably for mean max problems, then yeah, like uh, for the, uh, talk about the primal dual gap <clears throat> rate, and this is uh, one over k, but uh, codic. Yes. So so for each okay, so um, there are three types mm -hmm. of there are three types of rates that that uh, I guess has come up in our discussion. So there's the last iterate rate. Um, the okay. Uh, the best iterate rate is is uh, something like this, where we have we're, we're looking at we look at the smallest gradient, um, smallest value, and then there's the um, and there is the ergodic rate, where you you have have a rate on the average sure. iterates. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm not aware of, of 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 the ergodic rate on the primal dual gap for Paul Sang's FBF. So maybe no, but that's this is the, no. So 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 we proved this. So so the, so we okay. The, the, this one over k yes. But, see, but I again, see. I mean, since you, you said that, that uh, okay, there's a difference between FPF and, and FTA gradient, only if you have projection. So if, if the, you have only the, let's say, the, the, the gradient term, yeah? like they, mm -hmm. then they are similar. Yeah? So you, you get the same algorithm. So FPF, right, right, right. Yeah, it's the same as FTA gradient, and there is a difference yeah, if, if there is this non-smooth uh, operator, or, or mm -hmm. let's say for differential or whatever, normal cone, and then, yeah, you have one projection less. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But we, right. we, without it, that that part, yeah, the, you, you get the same algorithm. Right, right, right. In, but, indeed, without the yeah. backward step, it it's, it reduces to the, to the same thing. Indeed. Yes, it's the same. Yes, yes. But there is for FPF. So with projection, there is the one over k ergodic rate. Uh, yes, uh, similar to to what you are presented here. Okay. So uh, yes. then let us move to 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 another question. Patrick has a question. Yeah, uh, regarding FISTA G, um, did you look at actual convergence of the iterates? Uh, no. Um, so, so you're you're asking whether the the iterates um, the iterates themselves converge to um, well, but I, I okay. So I, I wouldn't expect. I'm trying to pull up the. I I wouldn't expect the iterates to converge because um, well, FISTA. The, the iterates of FISTA and uh, the well the other fast gradient methods they, they in general don't do, don't converge so but you know the, uh, there's a there's a fix by uh, Dossal and I'm uh, Chambre and Dossal that actually yes uh, you know it's a very tiny modification that drives actually the iterates to uh, uh, to converge so do you think such adjustment could be made here to keep the benefit of convergence which is in, in most application uh, very desirable 
and your rate on the uh, gradients. Um, I see, I see. Um, I think the answer is probably no. So, um, and here is, so, so here's why. Um, the, the convergence analysis of FISTG and also for OGMG, it doesn't actually assume that a solution exists. So here, I'm just assuming that this F star value is not negative infinity, but it could be that the problem doesn't have a solution. So, and that's, one could argue that that's a benefit of, of, of this type of analysis. So, um, so, if, so unless we add additional assumptions and, and so I guess it depends on how much modification we, we make, but uh, if, if the modification is very minimal, then the algorithm should still work in the, in the setup where there is no minimizer. And in that case, of, we wouldn't expect the iterates to converge to uh, a, 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 a limit. Okay. And maybe a remark on the, um, on the, on the second part of the talk, right? Where you, you discuss a very different type of rate, right? I mean, it's true when you have a, an expensive operator, what kind of rate can you hope for? And mm -hmm. so the, the only thing that is computable, let's say, is indeed the gap. Now, at the mm -hmm. same time, we, we learned early on in uh, numerical analysis, right, that the, you know, what happens to, to extend minus xn plus one or your gap here, it typically doesn't say much about the actual uh, behavior in terms of finding a fixed point. So do you have any insights of this? And in the background of this is that, as we know, those methods, for instance, can, in infinite dimension, they can stay stuck outside of a ball around the, the, the solution and converge only weekly, for instance. So, and yet mm -hmm. uh, things like this are computable, right? They, they are uh, work by community and so on. So what, um, what practical use would you think of this? Of course, beyond the obvious fact that the more we know about the, the behavior of the methods, uh, the better, but still, practically speaking, how would you interpret rates on the, on the step sizes? So, um, um, so, um, of, of, you're, you're of course very accurate uh, when you say that this uh, type of fixed point residual doesn't necessarily uh, exactly correlate with uh, the, the whatever accuracy that is, is, uh, is important at hand. So um, the, the, ex, the optimized Halpern method um, does converge strongly because it's, it's, a, it's a classical Halpern method. So that's a benefit of, of this algorithm converged to the regular KM iteration. But the way, um, uh, so in the paper that we are currently writing, we're trying to address that issue um, by through the experiments. And, and, what we will, and what we're trying to establish is that, so this here in this slide, we just have two convergence plus without any sort of further detailed discussions. But in our experiments, we're trying to show that by using um, this uh, anchoring mechanism and uh, by, by getting on quote, quote, acceleration, we actually do benefit the, uh, the, 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 the reconstructed CT image looks better. The uh, compressed sensing, uh, the, the support is better identified. So um, it's not, yes, so theoretically speaking, having a better fixed point residual doesn't necessarily correlate to, let's say the CT reconstruction being better, but um, in this ex experiments, we do see the benefit. So, and perhaps in a wider set of, in, in many, uh, problems that utilize splitting methods, there will be a benefit. So, uh, so that's uh, so we're trying to make an experimental justification on that uh, connection. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. So we Thank have you. a comment in the chat. So would you like to read it, Ernest? Yes. This is by um, Juan Pablo Contreras. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, with respect to the second topic, I'd like to highlight the rate help was appear. Oh yes. Oh, okay. Yes, thank you for pointing that pointing that out. So, okay, so to address that uh, comment um, more directly, so um, the one over k squared rate on in this uh, in this setup was is was not first established by Kim and Leader. It was indeed established first first uh, by well, at least it was established prior by Sabak and Stern in twenty seventeen. Yes, I. I, I forgot to mention that papers. Thank you for, for pointing that out. And that indeed, that proof is more general as it applies to not just the Euclidean or just not, not just the Hilbert space norm, rather to more general, general norms. So the constant is I think slightly bigger than this one, but that's the cost, that's the price that they pay, but it is a much more general result. Great, thank you, Ernest. Are there other questions, remarks, comments? 
Okay, so then I would like to make a final remark. So what we notice is still a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of, of work on the topic of uh, yeah, making algorithms uh, faster. And uh, yeah, we have seen today uh, several such approaches. Of, so to one in terms of uh, uh, yeah, this so-called fixed point residual, yes, like uh, difference of uh, consecutive iterates, and then one in terms of, of gradient so with gradients with different ideas. There was uh, also one for minimax problems uh, an approach. Of course, there is another open problem in this context, namely, and then this is this has uh, yeah, some connection to to the question asked by Mark. Namely, yeah, what about extending uh, Nesterov's uh, rates uh, to constrained problem, like for do, to primal dual algorithms? So this this is something which uh, was not covered in, in the talk today, and which is still a topic of uh, huge interest. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there are there are still many open problems to consider. So Ernest, it was a great talk, yeah. a very good discussion, a lot of enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for uh, your attention and for the great great yes. questions. Thank you. So uh, we will uh, post uh, the video and uh, the slides on our website. I'd like to announce that uh, our next speaker will be Robert Chednek from the University of Vienna. So uh, Ernest uh, in Seoul is uh, shortly before midnight, I guess. Indeed, yes. yes. I should so, go to bed soon. Yeah. Okay. I'm to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Good night. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank Thank you, everybody. So I'd like to say to the audience, have a nice week. See you next Monday. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.